Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. Good evening and welcome to the World Affairs Council. Tonight our guest is Philip Coggan, author of Paper Promises, Debt, Money, and the New World Order. My name is Heidi Schub. I'm president of the council and on behalf of the board of directors I welcome you all here this evening. Mr. Coggan is the Buttonwood columnist of The Economist and currently the Capital Markets Editor. Previously he worked at the Financial Times for 20 years as, investor, as investment editor and associate editor. At the Times, he also wrote the short view and the long view columns, in addition to the last word column on fund management. Among his books are The Money Machine, which is still in print after 25 years, and The Economist's Guide to Hedge Funds. He is the recipient of numerous awards and honors, including both the Senior Financial Journalist of the Year Award and the Best Communicator in the Business Journalist of the Year Award at the Wincott Foundation's Annual Press Awards, recognizing outstanding achievement in the field of economic, business, and financial journalism. He received the Journalist of the Year Award from the State Street Press Awards in Britain and the Best Newspaper Story at the Business Journal uh, Journalist of the Year Awards. In Paper Promises, he traces the current global financial crisis back to the 1970s, when the U.S. used gold to back the dollar and when countries would exchange their currency for it. When President Nixon abandoned the Bretton Woods fixed exchange rate system in 1971, there was no limit to the amount of debt that could be created and at the same time no limit to the debt. He described the different approaches, he, is, he describes in his book the different approaches tried by countries to get out of debt but remains uncertain uh, that such efforts will work. Perhaps we're all a bit uncertain right now. He is here this evening to tell us more. Please join me in welcoming Philip Coggan. Well, thank you very much, Heidi, and thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for coming on a rainy night. I was, uh, this time last week, I was in Dallas, and we started the uh, talk by uh, my host having a small competition to say which town has more annual rainfall, Dallas, Tunis in North Africa, or London. And most people in Dallas obviously thought the answer would be, but the answer is, in fact, Dallas. London has less annual precipitation than New York, and I've only been here since this morning, and I figure we're beating Washington too. But thank you very much for coming out. Now, while I was here, um, I did what I did almost every day, and I did something that my ancestors would have considered miraculous. I handed over a piece of paper like this, and I got a Starbucks, a real good in exchange, something that people 800 years ago thought was very strange. Indeed, we know we thought they thought it was very strange because when Marco Polo went to China, he was astonished that this actually went on, that people in China handed over pieces of paper because it was the tenth from the, in the 10th century that the Chinese first developed paper money. They abandoned it by the 16th century, funnily enough, just as we were discovering the printing press. But it was a sign, he thought, of the power of the Grand Khan who was a uh, descendant of Genghis Khan at the time, that he could get people to exchange paper for their goods. That he thought was a marvelous thing. Now, the puzzle to me, I suppose, the puzzle to everybody, is if I can give this piece of paper with five on it, why can't I give this piece of paper, which has 10 on it, not only that, but it has the queen's head on it. In fact, it has, uh, is it Dickens or Darwin? Dickens on the back of that, you know, you get two portraits for the price of one on there. And it says, I promise to pay the bearer on demand the sum of £10 on this piece of paper as well. And while I'm at it, why can't I take the money from my kids' Monopoly set, some of which has 500 written on it? I should be able to get lots of Starbucks for that. Now, why can't I do that? Why can't I use Thai Barts in a Washington Starbucks? The reason is, of course, as you know, that it's not legal tender. So the first thing we have to think about with money is what really is it? And it's the government's power that makes this worthwhile here and not that. Whereas back in London, you can try offering this, but you won't get very far. So part of the value of 
paper money is thus faith in our economy, faith in our system, faith in the government to keep going. Now, the second way of paying for your Starbucks, of course, is to hand over some sort of electronic money, some uh, debit card or credit card or whatever. Now, what makes Starbucks accept that as opposed to any other form of money? Well, the answer, again, is that they haven't analysed the accounts of the banking se sector to decide that uh, all is well with MBNA or um, MasterCard. They, again, believe that the financial sector is backed by the government and that the government will stand behind it if it fails. And exactly what happened in 2008 when the banks got into trouble, government stood behind the banking system. So all our modern money is in, excess, in it, uh, essence a statement of faith in our economy and in our uh, ability of our governments to collect taxes, finance themselves properly. So you can say that governments really have three tasks in this way. The first is to make sure that our paper money continues to have some value. They don't issue too much of it. So you know the stories about the Weimar Republic where people left baskets of notes out in the street, came out again, found that the notes were still there and someone had stolen the basket. That was when money was worthless. There's a sign you can find on the internet about Zimbabwe dollars more recently where it says please do not flush Zimbabwe dollars down the toilet because it had become just that, paper, which is in all paper money, of course, in essence is. So the government has to make sure the internal value of its currency is worth something. And secondly, it has to make sure that the external value of its currency is worth something. So if the currency is endlessly falling against other currencies, it's difficult for you to get it accepted for trade, to buy foreign goods. And the third function a government has to fulfil is to... Um, make sure that it can finance itself at a reasonable rate. So it can, when it does have a shortfall between its revenues and its spending, and most governments do at the moment, it can borrow the money in the markets and not pay through the nose for it. So we can say that uh, Zimbabwe recently failed those first two tests, the internal value of money and the external value of money um, declined, and Greece has failed that third test, and Portugal. These are countries which cannot raise money from the markets, cannot convince other people to lend them money at a decent rate, and have to depend on their neighbours in the EU to keep them going. The second point that follows from all this is that most money is really a form of debt. Back when we had gold and silver, you could own gold and silver, and it's no one else's liability. It's still just yours. But the... Most of the money that we use today is a claim on someone else. So our credit card, our debit card, our bank accounts are all liabilities of someone, banks or credit card companies. So the issues of money and debt, which are tied together in the subtitle of my book, are intimately connected nowadays, which they weren't necessarily in history. You could own gold and it wouldn't be a debt. Money also has two really key functions. I don't know how many of you are economists, and I have to speak to both economists and um, real people on a regular basis, so I'll make it a real people explanation because economists make things too complicated. But the two key functions are that money is a means of exchange. Now, I, when I went into the Starbucks today, I, let's imagine I didn't have a, we didn't have money. I'd go up to them and say, I'd like a grande non-fat latte, please. In exchange, can I talk to you about the history of the euro, I can throw in, if, you, if I want an extra shot, I could throw in perhaps the Australian dollar or the pound. How's that sound to you? Or when going on the subway, I could go up to the guard and say, you know, interested in the stock market? I could make some suggestions about valuations if you like. It would obviously be a very cumbersome means of conducting economic activity. So money is vital for the sense that we use this every day to oil the wheels of commerce. But the second function of money is that it's a store of value. So we want to be reasonably sure that this will still buy a Starbucks in 12 months' time and that the money we put aside for our daughter's weddings or our pensions will still have some money, value in 30 or 40 years' time. And you can also look roughly through history and say that those two functions of money have been in conflict so that people who have wanted to encourage more economic activity, more trade, more the greater ability to... Uh, buy in Starbucks or buy goods, have wanted more money to be created. Obviously, if Starbucks did take my kids' monopoly money, I could buy an awful lot of Starbucks, and that would be good for me in the short term at least. But the people who believe in 
money as the store of value want the supply of money to be limited. So those two things have, have clashed through the centuries. And a key character in the book is um, William Jennings Bryan. William Jennings Bryan was a kind of Barack Obama of the late 19th century. He was a uh, powerful orator, a Democratic senator from a Midwest state. He fought, he actually campaigned against a military veteran in his first campaign. And he made a powerful speech uh, in favor of expanding the money supply. His cause was bimetallism, which sounds very obscure. But all he was arguing for was to add silver to the currency. He was in favor of what we now call quantitative easing. And he represented the farming community of the Midwest. And in the late 19th century, food prices had fallen for some while. The farmers were struggling to pay their debts. So they wanted more money to be created, to prices to go up and make it easier to pay off their debts. And he was opposed by the East Coast interest, uh, William McKinley, who eventually got assassinated, as you know, uh, who was standing up for the old traditional East Coast story, sound money, balanced budgets. Now, one of the fascinating things about today, and uh, you know, I come here as a, a foreigner, often I, your politics is always amazing to Europeans, is that everything has flipped around. So William Jennings Bryan was essentially uh, standing for the kind of people who support the Tea Party today. He was a very religious man indeed. He ended up being a key prosecuting witness in the um, Scopes Monkey trial in Tennessee, arguing against the teaching of evolution. Um, back then, of course, um, you could have presidential candidates who didn't believe in evolution. Impossible to imagine today, of course. Um, and he, um, he, the, the people he supported were in favor of inflating away their debts. But now you flip forward 116 years, and the people who support the Tea Party are in favor of balanced budgets and against quantitative easing. And the Wall Street interest, Wall Street is in favor of quantitative easing because when the central bank goes into the markets and buys government bonds, it helps prop up asset prices, particularly equities, and makes Wall Street better off. So this flip over is only happened in America. You'll not find it in Europe. You won't find the people in Greece who are rioting on the streets arguing in favor of balanced budgets. You won't find them arguing for a very strict monetary policy, quite the reverse. And it's, it's interesting that only in America can you have a populist austerity movement. Anyway, William Jennings Bryan was therefore an early example of this battle between people who wanted to expand the supply of money to create trade and people who wanted to keep it restricted. And there's an even earlier example, which is a guy called John Law. John Law was a Scotsman who wound up in early 18th century France at the court of Louis XV. Louis XV um, succeeded his great-grandfather, Louis XIV, uh, who had been a monarch for 72 years. So he was only one year old when Louis XV um, became king. So naturally, he wasn't so big on decision-making at that stage, and there was a regent. And the regent was struggling to uh, deal with the French monarch's debts. So John Law came along with this bright idea. John Law's idea was that uh, up until then, you thought that wealth was basically gold and silver. And John Law said, no, the wealth of France is its farms and its factories and its shops. Create money, create paper money, and more activity will happen in the farms and the factories and the shops. And that more activity will bring in more tax revenues, and that more tax revenues will deal with your majesty's debts. So this first experiment in really creating paper money in Europe occurred then. He was a miraculous man. He dreamt up the first emerging market fund. He set up this company which was to exploit the French possession in the Mississippi. As you know probably better than I, I can't remember, it's not, there are nine states that the France owned in the middle of the country, basically, basically around Louisiana in the Mississippi Valley. So his argument was like emerging market funds today. These were bound to grow faster. There were lots of mineral resources. You just need to put your money in there and you'll make a fortune. So he persuaded people to invest money in this Mississippi company. And again, by shrewd promotion, by selling the shares at a cut rate price, he created the first real stock market bubble in history. The word millionaire was invented under John Law's um, scheme. 
who didn't, people never owned that much. Of course, they have to be billionaires today. But back then, the idea of owning a million of anything, any sort of wealth, was not known. Um, and for a while, it was an amazing thing. Paris boomed. There were a hunchback made a fortune, uh, maybe an apocryphal story, by renting out his hunch as a way to write contracts so people would come and do their, their stock, stock trading on his back. But it all collapsed in 1720. And the French have been deeply suspicious of paper money and in favor of gold almost ever since, and deeply suspicious of the finance sector ever since. But John Law, again, was another example of this tendency to think that if you just create more money, he was kind of the first Keynes, the first Paul Krugman, then wealth will follow. And nobody had thought like that today. Um, the second development that John Law illustrates is also that monarchs are not very good credit risks. People have talked about government bonds as being risk-free, and that's a standard sort of assumption in finance. But look back over history, and they weren't risk-free at all. So the first good example I found was a guy called Dionysus of Syracuse, and this is back in 6, 700 BC. He uh, confiscated all the coins in his land on pain of death, something that uh, IRS hasn't tried yet, but I'm sure it will think of it. Uh, stamped all the one drachma coins as two drachma coins, used half the money to pay off his debts, returned the rest of the money to the population, and Bob's your uncle. He'd solved his debt problem. Um, so he was um, a kind of relatively mild example of monarchs um, weaseling out of the debt problem. The Roman emperors used to struggle to pay their soldiers, and if you struggled to pay your soldiers, you'd pretty quickly be an ex-Roman emperor. So they would melt down their coins, add some copper to them, and then dole them out to the soldiers again. An easy way of balancing the budget. So this was a way that governments used in history. When they were struggling to pay their debts, they expanded the supply of money. Shoot forward 2,000 years, and it's all happening again. Governments around the world are struggling to pay their debts. Central banks are, helpfully, expanding the supply of money. It's all for our economic good, of course. That's what they'll tell you. But it is remarkable that it's occurred at that, for precisely the same moment that Roman emperors used in the past. The French, again, who always have an uh, interesting relationship with finance, medieval French monarchs would get out of the problem of uh, paying back their debts by jailing or executing their creditors. And if you look at the way that they sometimes regard the finance sector in London, you'll see that uh, perhaps they wish they had those powers today. You can also view um, the history of, of money and economic power as the way that certain countries used their coinage as a way of demonstrating their power. So it was that uh, King of Lydia who first, the, the, the first example of a monarch having his face on a coin. And if you think about it, it's the two real great things about having your face on, the, on a coin. First of all, you show the world that you're an important person. You show what you look like. Second, you show that you personally, by putting your face on your coin, that makes it have value. If you or I put a face on a coin, I'm afraid nobody would accept it. But if you can get that accept, accepted in the rest of the, your country and indeed in, in other countries in the world, that shows what an important person you are. So look back over history, which were the coins that traded um, widely. Athenian owls, Roman solidices, Byzantine Byzants, then you got into medieval Italy, you got the florin from Florence, which was still used as a coin when I was a kid in 1971. So these were the coins that circulated around. And we used to circulate, uh, coins used to circulate all around the world. The dollar, uh, you'll know that uh, this phrase in pirate movies, like pieces of eight, the parrot says, well, that came from the peso, which was indeed an eighth piece of a larger coin. So these coins would trade all around the world, and depending on their gold and silver content, they would be accepted around the world. Now, to go back to my core theme, debtors and creditors then represent these two functions of money, these two arguments about the nature of money quite clearly. The debtors want more money to be created. The creditors want the supply of money to be restricted. And over time, the creditors have seen the monarchs coming and seen debtors coming and tried to devise systems to try and prevent themselves from, be from being ripped off. So the best known example, which features in the presidential campaign even today, is the gold standard. 
the gold standard came about almost entirely by accident. Isaac Newton, who ought to know a thing or two, miscalculated the relative value of silver and gold in the early 18th century. And there's, a, there's an old rule called Gresham's Law, which is that bad money drives out good. So if you have a choice between two ways of paying money, and one of them you'd rather not have, you will pay that over and keep the good money for yourself. In his case, he undervalued silver relative to gold. So people hung on to the silver and paid out the gold. So gold coins became a regular means of exchange in, in 18th century Britain. And the beauty of the gold standard is, of course, that gold is very, very limited in supply. All the gold that's ever been mined in history would fill, would make a cube the size of a tennis court. So I suppose about the size of this room. You could get, you could get all the gold that's ever been made. Um, and gold, the gold, the era of the gold standard of Britain was extremely successful because of its limited supply in controlling inflation. In 1690, a taxi ride was about sixpence a mile. In 1896, it was exactly the same price. You did get fluctuations one year over another when food prices rose and fell because harvests were good or bad. But over the long run, prices stayed stable. Um, but the problem with that is that at uh, certain times, the money supply was extremely inflexible. And that's what created the demands of William Jennings Bryan. Now, it so happened that as William Jennings Bryan was campaigning in 1896, they were finding gold in Alaska. So it, the money supply was expanding just at the moment he was complaining it was too restricted. But if you start to think about that, it's a very odd way to base economic policy. You have to wait for some old timer with a beard and a pan to dig something up in some wild part of the earth if you want to expand the economy. It's a, it's a strange way of uh, running an economy. And a guy called Lord Addison, uh, who's quoted in the book, uh, said he was never convinced that digging gold out of the ground in South Africa, transporting it across the Atlantic and burying it under the ground under Fort Knox, which is what happens to it, is really a way of adding to the global to global wealth. It is a quite strange system, but it is very, was very effective at controlling inflation and thus very effective at uh, pleasing the creditors. So why did it work? It worked because the people in charge of the system back then were of the creditor classes. Up until 1900, there was no real mass democracy anywhere. It was more democratic in America. Um, but women couldn't vote until what was that? it was under Woodrow Wilson. Isn't it? I was just seeing it in the ex exhibit today. Um, and of course, uh, uh, senators weren't elected until I think 1920. Somebody will correct me if I'm wrong. Sen senators were appointed, not elected until then. So it wasn't a perfect democracy. But in Europe, there certainly weren't perfect democracies. And so the people in charge of the country were quite happy, were central bankers and things, were the type of people who owned money and were quite happy to keep money restricted. What happens when the gold standard has a bust? You have a very short and very sharp recession, and lots of people go out of work. Uh, if so, if you supply, if you restrict the supply of money, everything else in the economy has to adjust, and we can see that in modern version today in Greece. Greece has restricted its ability to create money, has restricted its ability to affect its exchange rate. 20 years ago, if Greece was in the problem it's in today, it would have devalued its currency and uh, creditors would have lost out to the extent of 10, 20 percent, and then Greece would have started all over again. But now it can't do that. So what, what happens? What does Greece have to do? It has to, instead of cutting its currency 20 to 30 percent, it has to cut its wages and prices 20 to 30 percent. And that is not something that people appreciate. So when you have democracies and you're asking the bulk of the population to take a sacrifice in terms of austerity, lower living standards, to please the creditors, it's very hard to do. And that's why it's so difficult in Europe at the moment. That's why Greece has an unelected prime minister, why Italy has an unelected prime minister and, and the cabinet. It's very difficult to force these policies through in a democracy. And that's why in the 1930s, the gold standard collapsed again, because they tried to put it again together after the First World War. Countries tried it for a few years, and they were just were unwilling to push through the kind of austerity needed to, to maintain the gold standard. So when that system fell, 
we then had the Great Depression, then we had the Second World War. They eventually came up with a second system to try and anchor uh, the value of money, and that was called Bretton Woods. So that was set up in a conference in New Hampshire in 1944. It was devised by John Maynard Keynes, the great economist. And instead of having uh, all currencies linked to gold, all currencies were linked to the dollar, and the dollar was linked to gold. And this was a remarkably successful system. In Germany, the 30 years after the Second World War were known as the Wirtschaftswunder because the economy grew so fast. In France, and I apologize for my terrible French accent, they were les 30 glorieuses, the glorious 30 years. Economies grew very fast as we emerged after the Second World War because the 50s were seen as a fairly golden age in America as well. And this system was based on fixed exchange rates based on the dollar. So why did it break down? In this system, in the Bretton Woods system, it all depended on the US. The US was the only country which was obliged to exchange its currency for gold. That meant that if the US, if there was any doubt about the US commitment to the system, the US would have to change its economic policies to suit the rest of the world. Now, I know I'm English, and I apologize for this if it sounds an insult, but by experience in the rest of the world, we find that American politicians are not that keen on changing policies to suit everybody else. Domestic considerations tend to come first. And in 1971, President Nixon, uh, facing an election the following year, had the choice between cutting back economically or abandoning the link between the dollar and gold. And he uh, famously said, I don't give a expletive deleted about the lira and dropped the link to gold. And that was the last time metallic money had anything, had, had any uh, existence in the world. From 1971, as Heidi mentioned in my introduction, we've been in a, in a whole new era where there's absolutely nothing standing behind these pieces of paper but our faith in them. It's like Peter Pan. I don't know, do you, have, you don't have pantomimes here so much, but in Britain you have Peter Pan, and at the end of Peter Pan, the audience has to clap if it believes in fairies, otherwise Tinkerbell will die. We all have to keep clapping every day. We, Starbucks has to keep taking those pieces of paper. We have to keep accepting money that's just blips on a computer. I mean, it's all incredibly nebulous. You think about quantitative easing, right? What does happens with quantitative easing? The Federal Reserve buys bonds off an investor and credits the computer account of that investor with an amount of money, some, some electronic blips. It's a bit like one of those emails that you get from like the widow of a Nigerian dictator, and it's come true. <laughs> just give me your details of your bank account and I will send you $22 million. And this is just, it's not signed a batcher or whatever, it's signed Ben Bernanke. And then you say, you send them details of their bank account and they do credit you with $22 million. It's fantastic. So that's what it is. It's just the creation of out of thin air of new money. So that was, this is a question, of course, which mankind has grappled with for thousands of years. OK, we don't want to restrict the supply of money just to the amount of metal we dig out of the ground. That sounds silly to people. So let's have no restriction. But once we have no restriction, what's to stop you creating money indefinitely? Just turning it into confetti or toilet paper like Zimbabwe. And it's very difficult to get that balance. And for the last 40 years, we've been struggling to do so. We have created lots of money, and we have ended up creating lots of debt. And as I argued to you before, the money and debt are intimately connected. So once the uh, once the system emerged, how, how did it sort itself out? Well, before 1971, people would have thought that if you had no link between paper money and gold, you'd have hyperinflation, like you did in some countries after the First World War. Well, we didn't get hyperinflation. Why not? Because Paul Volcker at the Fed in the late 1970s, after a burst of inflation, conquered inflation by raising interest rates very high, causing a big recession, but he got inflation down. And people then had confidence that central banks, these brilliant people at central banks, would be able to control the inflation rate and manage the economy. As I think it was John McCain said of Alan Greenspan in 2000, if you died, we'd put dark glasses on you and prop you up and still keep you in office. These people were so brilliant that they would be able to manage the economy. Was it their brilliance that kept things going? I don't think so. What happened in the 80s and 90s, as well as the central banks having independence, was that China, 
and then later on uh, Eastern Europe was coming into the global economy. And it was, the effect was to cause a massive sort of benign shock to the economy. It forced down prices because you had suddenly this vast horde of workers entering the global economy, keeping down wages in the West, keeping down the prices of things like electronic goods. And that was a big driver in the fact that inflation was so low. But what happened in this new system? The new system was dramatically different to what we had before. So under Bretton Woods, the fi the, uh, it wasn't po possible to move capital easily around the world. When I was a kid, you could take no more than 50 pounds worth of sterling on holiday. That meant well, a couple of rounds of margaritas in a Spanish club, and then you were done. So people didn't go on holiday very much overseas, um, but you couldn't invest over overseas very easily either. Once that system collapsed, there was no need for all those capital controls. So Ronald Reagan, Margaret Thatcher in the early 1980s um, got rid of them. So suddenly money started flowing around the globe very easily. And suddenly the finance sector started to pick up in importance. So if you look at the uh, numbers, the relative wages of people in finance relative to the rest of the economy uh, took off from the early 1980s. And I don't think that was a coincidence. Back in the, uh, before then, being a banker was seen as a very, very dull job. They were sort of worthy people. They were not masters of the universe. When I started at the Financial Times, the joke about fund management was, why don't fund managers look out of the window in the mornings? And the answer was, because then they'd have nothing to do in the afternoons. <laughs> that, too, was seen as a very dull job. These were not, you know, hedge funds and private equity people. Hedge funds and private equity, indeed, were unknown under the Bretton Woods system. There was Alfred Winslow Jones started a hedge fund in the late 40s, but it was a tiny, tiny industry. What happens when you release the, the supply of money like this? There's no constraint on you to create um, credit. You have industries which emerge, hedge funds, private equity, which basically borrow money to buy assets. And it was a great bet for a long time. And when these systems are in their benign phases, it all seems fantastic. So central bankers think they're brilliant because they're managing the economy and we have very few recessions. People who buy houses think they're brilliant. I bought this house for $100,000. It's now $250,000 or whatever. I'm a genius, but of course it's general inflation of house prices. Uh, fund managers think they're brilliant because they buy you know, the NASDAQ at 1,000 and it goes to 5,000. And the whole system perpetuates itself. If you're a bank and you lend money to someone to buy a house and the house goes up in price, you have more security. Uh, more people see house prices going up and want to borrow money, so they borrow more. And the fact that you have more people to borrow money means the house prices go up further, which means the banks feel even more confident and so on and so on. So you can, for a long time, create a very benign boom where borrowed money is used to buy assets and that pushes assets prices even higher. And central banks kept the whole show on the road by whenever the markets faltered, they would cut interest rates. So they did in 1987, if you can remember back to Black Monday when share prices fell 23% in a day. That was followed by immediate cuts in interest rates. They did in the early 90s when the savings and loan industry wobbled. They did in 1998 when long-term capital management, the big hedge fund, got in trouble. They did in 2001 after the dot-com crash. And so on and so forth. And of course, they've done it now. And the end game of that process is where we are today. We are at zero interest rates, never been known in history. The Bank of England was in existence from 1694 through three centuries. It went through two world wars, a great recession, and hundreds of years without inflation. It never cut rates below 2%. Now they're 0.5%. Fed has rates at virtually zero. Um, you have the central banks intervening to deliberately to keep asset prices higher by buying government bonds and by definition they want um, equity markets to be higher. Ben Bernanke has said very much. So we have this whole system which is devoted to keeping asset prices up and we've had created a generation of people who go into finance thinking that if we speculate, if we borrow money to buy assets, we will make out and become rich. Look at who have become billionaires in the last 20 or 30 years. Yes, there's the odd exception like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. But if you look at the lists of rich people in the West, then most of them have come out of finance, hedge fund um, and bankers. Look at it in the developing world, it's not like that at all. So usually people have worked in natural resources.
So we have changed the the way that the system has operated. We created this sort of vast um, train bearing down, carrying debt levels and asset prices higher. Um, and we got to the mess that we're in today where we have very high debt levels and central banks propping up asset prices. So why do I think that's a problem and why can't we go on and just keep going like this and having you know endless rounds of quantitative easing um, and zero interest rates forever? Well, I, uh, out of tribute for being here, I, um, one person who loves to quote from Yogi Berra. And Yogi Berra was eating pizza in a restaurant once and he was asked whether he'd like the pizza cut, how many slices he'd like the pizza to be cut into. And he said, I'd like to be, it to be cut into four slices, please. And then he said, no, wait, I'm hungry. Cut it into eight. OK. <laughs> now, the problem with all this process of creating more money to prop up the asset markets is it's not actually creating more pizza. We have been better at creating claims on wealth than we have at creating wealth itself. And this is just another example where we have created more claims in the process of keeping the show on the road. In the end, we need to create more wealth. Now, the best way to get out of a debt crisis is to grow your economy rapidly. That's how we got out of a debt crisis after the Second World War, much higher debt to GDP ratios for governments. But think about it. When you come out of a war, a lot of people are in uniform. A lot of industry is devoted to making you know, bullets and tanks and things that can be put to more productive uses. When we came out of the Second World War, we had the baby boom. I'm in the come from the late end of it. Um, and suddenly, the, in the 1970s and 1980s, we got another surge of growth as people um, like me started to join the workforce. We don't have those advantages to look forward to today. There's no industry we're all going to switch everybody out of. Um, yeah, obviously, we have had some wars, but they're much smaller scale than the Second World War in terms of how e the economy has been directed. And in Europe, we have a particular demographic problem. Europe the working age population is set to fall over the next 30 to 40 years, not rise. Now, economic growth can essentially come from, from two ways. You can have more workers or you can make workers more productive. Well, we can make workers more productive and there are plenty of reforms in Europe, but that tends to only help to the extent of, you know, 1% to 2% a year. You need more workers to keep the whole system going. Think of it really like a pyramid scheme in which you need a new supply of suckers with every generation. That's certainly how house prices work. How did we ever think that we could get rich as a nation by selling each other our houses? It makes no sense whatsoever. It's as if we were on a desert island and there was a coconut tree and there were two people and we were endlessly tra tra trading coconuts, sorry. Uh, it's not a way to get rich. Um, and so if you have a smaller, younger generation coming up than you um, did the previous generation, then what's going to happen to house prices? They're going to fall in real terms over time. Um, so that's a particular problem for Europe. America is in a better position demographically, but it still has its own problem. And its problem lies in the, again, going back to the title of my book, which is paper promises. We really have sort of three forms of paper promises. So our money is a paper promise. Our debts are paper promises, promises to repay. And then we have promises we've made to our citizens in the form of benefits pensions, health care, and so on. And my argument is that some of these promises have to be broken. We cannot pay all our debts and pay all our benefits uh, in real terms. So there are, in some body is going to have to be disappointed. So if we don't grow our way out of a problem, what, what's going to happen? So we can obviously renege on our promises to our citizens and in Britain we're already doing that the way that pensions are being adjusted for public sector workers is being downgraded with relation to inflation this is something that um, your government may attempt over time uh, as a way of dealing with it we make people retire later which is sensible on all sorts of grounds people are living longer so they should be able to work longer and of course if you uh, if you get them to work longer, they produce more, which keeps economic activity uh, higher. There's a, a problem I battle with, which people argue about this. It's, uh, they, they say that old people should retire so young people have jobs. And, and economists call this the lump of labor fallacy. It's been used in the past to argue that women shouldn't work because men should keep the jobs. And it's used, of course, to argue that immigrants shouldn't work because native people should have jobs. 
but it's just nonsense if you think about it. If the answer is that old people should retire to get young people jobs, why keep the retirement age at 65? Why not make it 55 or 50? If this is the answer, we should all retire at 40 and then we'd be millionaires. Well, that's not going to be right, is it? How can paying people not to work make an economy richer? What happens when old people work? They earn money, they spend it on goods and services, which employs other people, young, old, middle-aged and the rest. What happens when women work? The same thing. So economic activity will not suddenly surge if we stop a certain segment of the population working. Anyway, sorry, little moral lecture there. Um, so our struggle is if we're not going to grow from having more workers because it's, a, it's difficult, we're, that's not how we're going to get out of the problem. So depending on the way the system works, different countries will try different solutions. In Greece, because they're limited in their ability to create money, they're just doing an outright default. So at the moment, they're defaulting to private sector creditors. But in the next two or three years, you'll see them default to the official creditors like the European Union and the European Central Bank. And other countries in Europe will do the same thing. In Britain and America, we have the option of inflating away our debts. That is, we just create more money. So in effect, we're paying people back in monopoly money, even though it doesn't look like that. Now, quantitative easing is in part a way of attempting that, though they won't admit it. Um, but it's actually more difficult than you'd think to actually create that kind of inflation. In Japan, they've been doing this kind of policy for 20 years. They've had zero interest rates, they have had quantitative easing, and they haven't yet succeeded in creating inflation. And so it, what's happened to the money that the Fed has created or the Bank of England has created, it has not led to high inflation. It has just sat in the banking system. In fact, we've had the wrong kind of inflation over the last three or four years. If you want to get rid of a debt problem, you need to get people's wages up, because when people have more wages, they can pay off their debts. What's happened in America and Britain? Wages have been stagnant, but we have seen higher food and energy prices. Well, that makes things worse because we have to spend more of our income on food and energy, and thus we have less left to service our debts. So that's the worst uh, answer to the crisis that we've come up to. So if we're not going to do that, then we're going to struggle for the next 10 or 20 years. This is going to be a battle which is going to define politics. It's not an economic textbook issue. It's a political issue for the next 10 to 20 years. It's going to pit old against young. It's going to pit rich against poor. It's going to pit public sector workers against taxpayers. It's going to pit one country against another, as with Germany and Greece at the moment, and indeed with China and America. So that takes me to the last part of my subtitle, which is the New World Order. As I try to outline, over time, creditors have devised systems to try and keep the debtors in line. Britain, as I said, was the country that originally devised the gold standard. Bretton Woods was, though it had the intellectual inspiration of Keynes, was a system endorsed and enforced by the United States because the United States was the dominant economy and creditor of the 20th century. Come into the 21st century, which is the dominant creditor nation? <coughs> Excuse me. It's China. <coughs> so China, when the system eventually gets remade, which will take not next year, but five or ten years, China will be the, the dominant force in setting the rules. What does China like? I'm going to have to just be slightly technical for one minute. Now, I forgi uh, forgive me for economic jargon. So they have, we have with um, all international systems what's called a trilemma. You can have three things. You can have fixed exchange rates. You can have independent monetary policy, which means the right to set your own interest rates. Or, and you can have free capital movement, but you can't have all three. So go back to the gold standard. You had fixed exchange rates. You had free capital movements, but you didn't have independent monetary policy. If you were running short of gold, you had to raise interest rates until you got more gold. You had to govern your system with a view of making sure that your accounts balanced. Under Bretton Woods, you had fixed exchange rates, you had independent monetary policy, but you didn't have free capital movements. As I was saying, you couldn't take money out of the country. For the last 40 years, we've had independent monetary policy, very free capital movements, but we haven't had fixed exchange rates. What does China like? China likes managed exchange rates. It doesn't like free capital movements. 
So what will a new system look like in 10, 15 years? It will look more like that. I envisage some sort of grand deal between the Americans and the Chinese, who are the only two parties in this that really matter, in which China agrees to let its exchange rate appreciate at a certain level, and America agrees to limit its deficits. Now, you may say Americans will never take orders from the Chinese, but eventually you can't be rude to your creditor forever. My sister never had great trouble with, uh, never been good with her finances. She often writes to a bank manager threatening to take her overdraft elsewhere. <laughs> but there's a, a limit to the times you can, you can do that. And there's a limit to the ability that you can really be rude to your creditors. And if you talk to the Chinese, they are already very, very suspicious of American credit. When Tim Geithner spoke at uh, Beijing University and he said, your treasury bonds are safe in our hands, they laughed. When America was downgraded in August, Xinhua News Agency put out a release saying, America, you need to get your act together. You cannot go on like this, spending and spending and spending. That's the way they view America. They view America the way Germany views Greece. So that's going to be the key relationship. So to sum up, we've had cycle after cycle of creditors battling debtors in which the nature of money has changed. We've just had a huge spree and the bill is coming due. The fact that the bill is coming due means that politics is going to be dominated by this issue and international relations are going to be dominated by this issue. Power is shifting. Power has shifted in the past. In the 16th century, Spain was a dominant power. It went bankrupt, trying to invade Britain, serve them right. And uh, it was not a dominant power in the 17th century. In the 17th century, it was France. Again, as I was telling you, Louis XIV ran out of money, attacking Britain again. You see, it's not a good idea. Uh, and France, eventually the French monarchs fell because of their financial problems to the French Revolution. Britain, in the 19th century dominant, bankrupted itself in two world wars. America has been dominant in the 20th century. Now, America will always be important. The, it will always be one of the, you know, the biggest countries in the world. But its unipolar moment is passing because power, economic power is shifting east. So this, the new world order is emerging. And it's got to be one in which China plays a prominent part and America can't just set the rules on its own. Thank you very much. Could you comment on the relationship between the um, Glass-Steagall Act, economic stability, and the current situation of econ economic inequality and how that plays into the stagnation with wages and so forth? Do I think that um, the... the system we've had for the last 40 years has encouraged economic quality, inequality. Yes, I do. And if you look back at the previous 35 years, it was known as the Great Compression among economists in which um, wage uh, differentials narrowed um, quite significantly. And it's only from post about 1980 that this huge inequality started to emerge. And in those countries in Europe which don't have a dominant finance sector, inequality hasn't increased as much. Now, there are many arguments about this, and my colleagues um, in Washington don't you know, look at many different factors. There's this argument about skill-based technological change, that, you know, there are certain people who are just very good at something. There's a global market for talent, just like um, Jeremy Lin, you know, is probably going to be, is it, is it Jeremy? Yeah, I think it is. Is, you know, is going to be a very highly priced ta talent now, suddenly, because uh, he does something that other people can't do. Um, but you go back, I go back to the point that um, a lot of these deals were based in things like hedge funds where it's been rising asset markets that have provided the key support. So Glass-Steagall, I think what happens when the finance sector starts to do well is that its influence steadily increases. Eisenhower, going back 50, 60 years, talked about the military-industrial complex. But you could talk about the sort of financial, governmental complex. Um, if you think back to the early 1960s, who did John Kennedy bring into um, office? It was Robert McNamara, who was the head of Ford. He thought um, people in the auto industry were the smart people. What's good for General Motors is good for America, was the argument back then. It became what's good for Goldman Sachs is good for America. We had people moving from Goldman Sachs into government. Why? Not because it was a grand conspiracy, but because people generally thought that people who work for Goldman Sachs are smart. And of course, a lot of them are very smart. Um, but the problem with that is, of course, then uh, it becomes very self-fulfilling and, and the uh, government starts to do what the finance sector wants. 
because they also provide a lot of the funding for politicians as well. Um, and there's a good book on this, which I recommend by a guy who was the chief economist at the IMF called Simon Johnson, called 13 Bankers. It's a story, starts with the story of Larry Summers when he was Treasury Secretary. I think he was in a, in a room, he's calling uh, the head of the CFTC, and he says, I hear about your latest proposal. I've got 13 bankers in my office who say this will be the end of Western civilization or something. So this, this is the argument. So on the encouraging side, however, I think that um, what's happening now with um, more regulation, banks being required to put up more capital, with the debt sort of super cycle really being interrupted, is the finance sector will steadily become less important over time, will become you know, more what it should be, a vital part of an economy, but not the only part of the economy that anyone cares about. And that hopefully will, re will result in less inequality, more equality, that would be a better phrase. Isn't it? Do you think uh, creditor countries like China might be able to force debtor countries to issue their debt in the renminbi or the yuan? Could that would give China more control over the situation of preventing the debtor nation from manipulating its, its currency? It would also probably take some of the pressure off the Chinese to force their exchange rate to to float and, and fluctuate a little more. The second question yep. is whether or not you think there's any uh, future for the notion of a composite international currency for certain transactions, a currency made up of a blend of the euro, the dollar, the won, renminbi, the sterling, and the like for international transactions to perhaps lend a little more stability to international pricing. Well, the Chinese are gradually opening up the renminbi. I mean, um, and they're allowing people to have overseas accounts and allowing some, they're issuing some bonds in renminbi and so on. Um, I don't think they could force us to issue in renminbi, but if you look at w emerging markets, as they used to be called, have this problem of what they was called original sin. They couldn't borrow in their own currencies, they had to borrow in dollars, though, though now they increasingly can borrow in their own currencies. So we could get to the, sa the stage when, you know, European nations, for example, it would happen to Europe more first before the US, found it was a lot cheaper to issue in renminbi than it was in euros, say. In which case, that would be not forcing, but you know, just um, the logic of cheaper financing being, being pushed through. Um, your second part of the question, sorry, my mind's gone uh, with answering the first. Currency. Composite currency, yes. In fact, somebody sent me an email yesterday proposing one, and there's some um, launch next week. Well, we have the special drawing right, uh, of course. Uh, though that doesn't include the renminbi, it has to be convertible to be in the SDR. And it's been around, this was a great idea of Keynes in the in Bretton Woods, he called it Bancor. Uh, and um, the Americans essentially vetoed it. Uh, and indeed the Americans wanted uh, a system which had no constraints on creditor nations at all because that back then they were a creditor nation. Of course, now they would like some restrictions on China because <laughs> they're not a creditor nation. So it just shows what goes around comes around. Um, the problem with the SDR is it's been private sector hasn't wanted to use it. So yes, the IMF uses the SDR, and you can imagine the IMF adopting your, you know, much broader foreign currency. But could you buy your Starbucks with it? Could you buy your? Could you do international takeovers in it? It would take it would take a collapse in one of the big currencies, I think, for people to turn to that. And if the composite currency includes that currency that currency that's collapsed, then again, that makes life difficult. So um, there have been proposals for currencies based on a broader basket of commodities instead of just gold. You know, I can imagine in, in a case of complete economic collapse that that would happen, but let's hope that we don't get there. Do you think that at some point soon the uh, creditors of, uh, of the United States will at some point begin to question our ability to make good on those debts and all of a sudden cause either a spike big spike on a Tuesday morning of interest rates or a crash in assets? Mm. Well, you're, you're absolutely right. And Standard & Poor's downgrading the US credit rating is exactly that. Credit, creditors starting to lose faith. And the Chinese giving their lectures, that's a, a similar thing. Um, is it going to happen next week or the week after? I don't think so. I and mean, there's a guy I was talking to from PIMCO, uh, the big fund management firm, who's saying that the US is the, the least dirty shirt Right, so you know when you're going out in the evening and you look through, you realize you haven't got a clean shirt, so you hunt through the laundry and you find one with a smaller stain or whatever, then that's what the US is. It's not that it's brilliant, it's just that the US is still the biggest economy in the world, still the most liquid market. And so if you're gonna have your money somewhere, you'd rather have it in the US than say Greece. And you'd probably really rather have it in the US than Germany because you think that Germany's gonna have to pay for Greece. So still the US has that advantage. So I think you're the sort of 
last domino to fall. But yes, I think that's why we will remake the system eventually. In five, six, seven years' time, there may come this point when suddenly U.S. bond yields shoot up and suddenly the U.S. realize it has to do something about it. And of course, it could be an entirely self-inflicted wound. We were sort of boggling our minds in August last year when it appeared like Congress wouldn't raise the debt ceiling and the U.S. could go into technical default, even though it could easily pay its bills. But, you know, you never know what might happen. Uh, again, I struggle as a European to understand your budget system. In Britain, you, whatever you think of our prime minister, he proposes a budget and the next day it's enacted. And that's what happens here. You know, so the president proposes something, House proposes something, the Senate proposes something, and they, you know, take ages to agree. It doesn't seem like a sensible way to run an economy. Not, not to me. As I understood it, and maybe I got it wrong, we're saying that the, the debt crisis um, uh, with the U.S. vis-a-vis -vis China, that could take about five to ten years to play out uh, to where, where, where really will come to a head. Mm. Do you see the same timeline with e the EU as a whole versus its creditor nations, which includes China, at, in the same timeline? Or do you see that there's a, the crisis could, uh, you know, we, we read about that in the paper every day right now, come to a head quicker uh, in the EU? We may, ca may come to a head in the next week or two in Greece. Right. Um, but it's partly how Greece plays out that's the key here. So essentially you've got this um, battle between creditors and debtors that's sort of made very real where the Germans are saying they will lend the Greeks money and insisting on policies from the Greeks and insisting that democratic politicians uh, commit themselves to pursue those policies even post an election. Now, the very interesting thing is whether the Greek population, I don't know if you've been to Greece, but they're, they're not happy about it. And um, so, so if Greece then falls out of the euro for whatever reason, um, and suddenly you have the drachma instead of the euro in your bank account. Think what that means to if you're a Portuguese or an Italian, say. So you see your your compat your not compatriots, but your fellow Europeans suddenly lose thirty or forty percent of their money overnight if they've kept their money in Greece. You think to yourself, Am I going to keep all my money in the bank account in Portugal or Italy, or shall I just nip over the border and put it in France? There's no there's no capital controls. There's nothing to stop you moving over the border. You know, if, if it happened, they could say in D.C. that all the bank, banks were going bust, you'd probably move your money to Virginia or Delaware or something, wouldn't you? It, it's just prudence. And so if Greece was chucked out or left, then you could instantly see a, a run on the banking systems of those other countries, and that would precipitate the crisis. And that's, of course, why it's a gigantic game of chicken in which um, – the Greeks are well aware they have that power, and the Germans are well aware of that's happening. So why I think in the end the Germans will pay. Uh, somebody sent me a joke the other day. It was an Italian, a Spaniard, and a Greek go into a bar. Who pays for the drinks? The German is the answer. <laughs> uh, and that's what's happening. Eventually the Germans have to pay. So, well, thank you very much all for attending, and thank you for coming on the <laughs> Wet Washing Tonight. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.